Right then, uh, I'm making a overdue and welcome return uh, to the show. I'd love to know. I mean, I struggle now to get through the back catalogue to work out when people came on because I seem to think that uh, that you were a very er- one of the earlier earlier entrants into the into my podcasting journey. Anyway, Stuart Morgan, welcome back. Thank you, Stu. I, yeah, I think I was. I think it was very much like I kind of quite liked it because you were out walking at some point and you were like, you know, recording <laughs> at the same time. And it was like quite fluid in how things were going. <laughs> uh, how things were going, eh? Hey? Um, but anyway, uh, it's good to have you back. And um, we've been having a bit of interaction uh, on LinkedIn and talking to each other and ranting. I've been listening to you on your brilliant podcast called Practice Thinker with Pete Arner and Ian Renshaw, um, which, as I said to you just before we started recording, prompts me to have loads of ideas, which I immediately want to get in touch with you about. Say, yes, we need to do this and we need to do that. <laughs> um, and uh, and you've been busy doing lots of other bits and pieces where you've got various different things. So first and foremost, uh, because people may not have gone through the entire back catalogue, uh, I wonder if you wouldn't mind reintroducing yourself to the audience and catching yeah. us up on what you're doing. Yeah, sure. So um, my name's Stuart Morgan. I work in uh, in golf um, and I've kind of like moved into different roles in golf. I kind of um, started out, I worked for David Ledbetter for many years. I'm a PJ member of, of Great Britain and Ireland and um, but kind of like branched off into just a level of interest, I think, into like how we practice and how we train because I've always felt that even when I was playing, you know, trying to compete, that it was this, we weren't like tapping into this enough. Um, and that's taken me on a, an amazing journey. Lived in America for a few years, been to the last two Ryder Cups players. I'm working in this space, um, doing a professional doctorate at the University of Limerick, um, where we're going to interview uh, golfers and about their practice and, and whatnot. And this is very much about just curiosity for me rather and trying to ultimately help apply, you know, all this stuff. And yeah, so I, that that's kind of where I am. I'm, I, I work for Swiss golf part-time and have private clients working professionally. So I work at that, you know, performance end of the sport and um, yeah, just trying to do the best and trying to, dig into the weeds and try and help players as much as possible, to be quite honest. Amazing. Um, it, it, you've actually jogged my memory. I remember when our, our, the podcast we did actually was with one of your young athletes, I seem to remember. They've been on this developmental journey. It was a female golfer, if I, if I, if I remember correctly. With M, Emily, I think, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, it might have been a father yeah, yeah. actually came on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was interesting. Oh, yeah, it was uh, Kelvin. Yeah, Kelvin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but... So, yeah. so do I? Do I? Um, if you're at University of Limerick, does that mean that you're rubbing shoulders with the amazing Phil Carney? Yeah. So I'm very, very lucky that Phil is um, one of my supervisors, oh, um, wow. <laughs> and also my primary supervisor is a guy called John Kiley. And oh God, wow! In in the Skillac space, people may not be so familiar with him, but he is an absolute legendary critical thinker um mm. he challenged the physical elements like periodization to a whole new level um mm. he 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 says to me he goes i i i never wanted to do that but i i don't know i think he he has this innate feeling that something is wrong or something mm. not, not wrong but just like not serving the athlete the best way possible and um it took him some time to dive deep and, and uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I'm so fortunate to have those two guys prom- prompting and probing and, and like guiding me through this kind of process. And I, and I've no, no doubt that come out at the end of it, um, we're going to have something pretty cool. I think. Awesome. We, we've got a lot to riff about, but um, just while we're on the subject then of your prof doc, um, Tell me a little bit more about what your um, 
studying and anything that you've learned so far? Yeah, so the idea was around, is obviously around practice, right? But mm. through, um, you know, chatting and, and as you go through this whole process, this critical thinking element, it's like I was at this like weird sensation of like, okay, well, I give something to a player and they practice it for a week or 10 days or two weeks. And then after that time, they go completely back to what they were always doing. And I'm like going, what's this about, to be honest? So it wasn't until I got chatting to John that we started to look at um, the beliefs of the athlete. And then Phil came on board. So now we're starting to like couple the beliefs and the skill acquisition and all these kind of elements together. And really just start to ask players golfers what are you doing around certain situations how are you training it why why do you believe in this and just trying to kind of understand like what what their kind of thinking is around a number of things and the belief element to me is like a real interesting one because we like, I mean, the, the episode you did with Phil was unbelievably good. Like, it was so – and I know that because I'm from speaking to him and, and whatnot, and I know how, how articulate he is and, and how well-read he is and, and so on and so forth. But it is what it is, right? It's like, well, you know, it's not just like, why do you believe this? Um, why do you do this? Oh, I don't know. Okay, my coach told me to do it. Okay, have you challenged your coach's beliefs? Uh, no. No. <laughs> I've never, I've never been down that road. All right, where does his beliefs come from? So when we have that, we ha we create this like path dependency, right? Mm. And if we don't challenge these things along the way, and I feel like I, I get like sucked into this. I don't think I think there's certain coaches and whatnot that are happy just to go along with whatever it is, but I, I, I'm not that kind of human being and I don't want to be that human that I just want to improve the way things that players do things in golf, uh, yeah. in a golf context. Um, and that comes down to beliefs and we, and we get, and the, the biggest form of a belief sapper right now is social media because there's so much bullshit on there that people that what we so call like influential others, right? So if you look at Ali Crumb's research at Stanford, right, to mm -hmm. do with like it's like a follow-on, it's like a more deeper dive into some of like Carol Dweck stuff, but it's more about mindset, but linked to beliefs, to how we can how we form beliefs and how we can challenge beliefs. Because that's the biggest part of it. And we have multiple things that happen within this. We have culture, where we where we grew up, what we did, how we did it, what our development is like. So as a golfer, like what our coaching, what's our surroundings like, social media, influential others, which kind of like ties in. And the biggest one, which nobody seems to think about, is we have a conscious choice. Mm. So when I look at the belief system of somebody like, Cameron McAvoy, who is a 50 meter sprint Olympic champion, if people want to look into that, he took a conscious choice to turn around and go, this training of what I'm doing right now isn't working. He's doing training like he's a 3,000 meter swimmer and he's a 50 meter sprint trainer <laughs> or, or swimmer. So uh, that that's what I'm trying to do, Stu. Really, is try, I'm trying to get players, right, in golf terms, to start to go and think: Is there something more efficient than what I'm doing? It doesn't need to be right. It's not. It's not about right or wrong. It's is it more efficient and effective? Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent.
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I look, so many jump off questions, but um, just going back to that podcast that I did with Phil, um, it just made me think like it, uh, it, that must be like what it's like to have a, like a tutorial session with him. Cause I felt like he contacted me with this kind of question about this notion of coaches having a bundle of beliefs, which is clearly like where you guys are going. And then it felt to me like he was, we were just sort of thinking aloud together. And it was like one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've done for ages. Like, cause it wasn't, we were just literally just sparking ideas and I'm prompting an idea in him. He's prompting an idea in me. And then we're sort of going off in these different directions. And I just thought it was absolutely fascinating to just spend that kind of like thinking time with somebody, you know, almost like thinking aloud together. And, if that's what it's like to have him as a PhD supervisor, then that is just brilliant, right? But I think, like Stu, in God's honest truth, I think if me and you get really into it based on our personalities, <laughs> we could be absolutely going on a tear here. <laughs> and I think some, and I think sometimes that when you listen, I, I love that concept. He says a sense making, mm. you know, um, chat, and I and I thought that. And there's so many things he talked about in there that he's spoken to me and he's like, he's guided me towards like reading and, and mm. so on and so forth. You know, even going back into like the skill act stuff, like going back to the military stuff, right. Mm. Into what mm. with like Richard Schmidt that he did for the military, you know, it's, yeah. it's when you dive back into that, it's like, Oh my God, I'm seeing mm. where all this stuff has come from, mm. but where does it stop? Right. Yeah. And and the thing is with Richard Smith, if <clears throat> we don't have uh, skill acquisition without Richard Schmidt and Carl Newell, to be honest, like I think yeah. that we have to look at it and, we, and people go, oh, yeah, we can't. Well, yeah, but no, his paper, like originally, like schema theory paper, I think um, Chris Colmurray, like mentioned it in one of your podcasts. He's like, well, yeah. But that's a starting point, right? If we go back to that right now and we read it, it's like, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about that, to be quite honest. And he even said that himself. Mm. But that's what it's about, isn't it? Yeah. That's it's yeah. that's what evolution is about. And that's what I think. It's not right or wrong. It's like even in practice in golf, right? And I look at it and I go, Wow, if I look back at like when I was playing around the Faldo era and and so on and so forth, like if I did, if I had like five hundred balls and I just hit them with a seven iron, which I was told to do, I'm probably going to improve something. But is that really what we want? What we need to be doing? Is there is there a higher level that we can go efficiency, effectiveness? and whatnot to help these skills kind of transfer. And I think that's really where I'm at at this moment in time, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I love that actually. It's like, you know, there's almost like a founding fathers type of thing, but yeah, like the ideas that the founding fathers had, like they don't stand up now, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> The so things move on and we build upon them and then we take them into different spaces and we go in different directions. And yeah, I, I really like that idea, actually. I've written that down. We don't have skill, skill acquisition without Richard Spin, Carl Newell. Yeah. And and it's it's like the, the you know, when we look at, I, you know, I really love that paper. I think Rob Gray talked about it with the, the, um, the police recently. Mm, mm, mm. And there was... Um, this linear notion of like learning, which I think golf is very, very synonymous of, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do this. And it, it, you know, however the time frame was or whatever it was, you know, it produced like, I think it was like a 19.5% increase in, in like adaptation and, and being able to like, improve like not in novel situations and whatnot which actually if you look back to i think it was a paper in like 2020 called R from ramen transfer of skill has, be has always been between sort of 15 and 30 percent of like transfer from where we start to where we're going for the last 30 years 30 plus years so so what that does to me that fits in within the mean right mm -hmm. 
but then I see the non-linear training and that goes up to like 40%. Mm. And now I'm looking at going, ah, that's more efficient or mm. I'm more effective and more, you know, like do we need to be going more in that road rather than um, rather than going back to that, uh, to that linear model. But the interesting thing, what I found in that paper, like chat, like going into it, the people they asked and said, what training did you prefer? And most of them said the linear form of training. But, but, but the thing is, this was <laughs> before they knew the results. Really? Yeah. What? So they like instinctively felt that the linear form was better. Yes. Wow, that's interesting. Because it fits with that sort of like. It, oh no, like, I did. I, I remember that. Yes, no, I remember that conclusion. Yes, you're right. Yeah, but it's like on, it's sorry. almost like it's like controlled, isn't it? It's like yeah. I, I feel yeah. like I'm in control. Any form of like chaos or whatnot, yeah. and that's what happens in golf. Any talk like they they just don't like it. Like if you did, if you went into golf world and went right, we're going to go full on differential learning in here. They're mm. going to be going. Whoa, hang on a minute. Like, what's this about? <laughs> <laughs> until you give them results. Mm. Mm. Now, yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't quite, I'd listened to that and I hadn't quite sort of twigged that sort of slight nuance, which is this idea that, you know, this sort of intuition that people have that, uh, where do you think that comes from? Uh, I mean, you may know, you may know, but like, is that just because of that sort of what people, what's, what's normalized and therefore, if you learn in a way that's not that's that's not in the normal way of learning, which is you know the linear tradition is extremely culturally resilient, right? Um, it's everywhere you go, you will see linear learning models. You know whether it's in coach education, whether it's in um, workplace learning, and you know the training things that people get whether you know whether you go any, any walk of life you will see linear learning models right because they're well actually because they're <laughs> they're actually efficient in the sense that, yeah. that they but when you were talking about efficiency you see you prompted uh there's a famous quote by a um um uh, famous management consultant called peter drucker who said yeah. i'll probably butcher it now but he says efficiency is doing things right if uh, sorry no, yeah effectiveness is doing the right thing I might have that the wrong way around. But um he, and the point being is that you can do things right really efficiently, but it isn't necessarily that effective. That's that's a beautiful thing, actually, because <laughs> I think I do think that Frederick Wimslow Taylor has a lot to answer for, to be honest. I think when when we look when we look back at this like and I don't know how it's somewhat it's all connected but it it is connected it, um, it is it is it's I mean it's unbelievable right and from a but but the lovely thing is like there's a there's a lady who's um a lovely lady like Mito Steroni right who is um a neuroscientist and um she's a medical doctor as well and she said in her book called Hyper Efficient, she says um, a, it comes from a linear, continuous assembly line emphasizing quantity over quality. Mm. Mm. And in this approach, you limit the highs and lows, but you limit the genius at the same time. And I thought that was just beautiful how she kind of wrote that. And it was like, oh, that really hit me because we can create this very linear sort of like line people up, do the same thing, you know, this what, and we keep them within these parameters. Yeah. But the amount of times I've heard, Stu, like through my years of like, oh, yeah, we, we, I can't deal with him. You know, I can't deal with her. She's completely out of the box. Yeah. The, now, this point about the highs and lows, right? So I've been uh, 
wanging on about this for quite a while. Um, again, this notion of um, the reduction, the reductionist approach yeah. that's, you know, the kind of the um, the shadow of Taylorism yeah. still, still, you know, is still cast across. So coach education is the very example of an efficient model. You know, you're getting, you're getting the maximum information in the minimum amount of time and you're calling that education. Um, and, and you, and what you do is you, you create this sort of artificial notion of, not in all cases, by the way, um, but you create this artificial notion of learning and assessment, uh, in order to verify that the, this sort of hyper efficient learning model has had some kind of effect. And the problem is that people have got agree that so their intuitions are that that's not particularly useful, and uh, and that's borne out largely by their experiences in coaching. But this is yeah. true, by the way, of talent pathways. So talent pathways have become uh, they they create a normalised approach which reduces highs and lows, minimises the. Uh, you know, so everyone talks about this notion of talent development being a rocky road. Well, actually, most talent pathways have sought to reduce the, the, the you know, the, the, the sort of challenges and the, and then the recoveries and the challenges and the recoveries. They've, they've deliberately tried to reduce those to minimize the impact on the athlete. And yet the highs and lows are actually where some of the deepest learning comes from. Yeah. Um, and actually, the the more organic and the less linear your talent pathway is, the more those natural sort of perturbations, if you like, um, uh, they 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 happen or, organically. So if you then wrap the right support around that individual um, by having the sort of guide by the side uh, who can help to sort of mitigate the impact a little bit. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means that the impact is mitigated. That can be hugely transformative. But because we've basically, we've got this coach education model, which basically says that all coaches are going to be trained in a very, very similar linear way. And therefore, yeah. to a certain extent, there's almost a bit of kind of groupthink around the way coaching takes place. You then have talent pathways, which are mapped against the coach's ability to be able to work together. So you've got basically now got hyper-industrialized coach education, hyper-industrialized talent development, and surprise, surprise, what you produce is mediocrity. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think in, in what what comes out of that is, you know, I don't I, not, I don't necessarily think it's the. I think the coach is gets influenced by X, right? Yeah. But I think that there's certain coaches that will turn around and go, well, have an experience like I had, like you had, but like, I'm going, this is, can't be it. You know, there, yeah. there must be something yeah. kind of like a little bit different, you know, within this and then start to go on that, on that journey. And and the thing is, like I said, is I, I remember asking a player, I was like, Oh, if you, if you need to go and like change your, or improve your technique, right. And you're working on something, what's your, um, what what would be your process of that? He goes, oh, I just go in a field, right, and get one club and just like drill it out, like thousands and. Th I was like, okay. He goes, is that wrong? I said, no, it's not wrong. You know, I said, but w what I'm interested in is where's that come from. And he went, oh, it comes from my like coach. I said, okay, where's that come from? Your coach. And he went, oh, he's a big Hogan fan. I said, but if we die deep, take a deep dive into Hogan, then that's not really what he did. You know, he hit a lot of balls, but it was very, you know, very deliberate in what he was doing. And, and you know, he was trying to eradicate, you know, a hook ultimately. I was like, OK. And he went, so is there an alternative? I said, well, yeah, there's many, many alternatives, you know, but it just depends on are you ready to go for those alternatives? Because you've been so drilled to think of this. And if I take you too much to this high end here, potentially, it might just be too far for you. So where are you willing to go? And I'll and I provide them with some different alternatives and some different like viewpoints and and whatnot and some different ideas. 
And that one of the simple things is most of the stuff that gets happened in golf that players do is very, very blocked within skill. Mm. Right? Mm. So if I then turn around to them and go, okay, I, you know, where, where's this? Why, you know, why you done the okay, it's come from here. It's come from here. Okay, great. All right. But do you know that you're kind of missing this area here that, that helps you transfer? So mm. can we just go like a bit more between skill here and add a little bit more challenge to this? And they're like, hmm, oh, I haven't really thought about that. Mm. Okay, why haven't you thought about that? Because I didn't know about it. <laughs> um, you made me think of something. I'm gonna it's, gonna, it's gonna be a digression, but hey, that's the nature of the beast, right? But um, you know, this notion of this blocked before we before I go on this digression, let me make sure I make um make a make a note of what I want to ask you about. Um, this notion of this blockness and Hogan and like th there is a very very pervasive idea not just in golf i think in lots of sports by the way and actually you talk about cameron mcavoy right love that by the way i love listening to that story um but so the dominant paradigm and extremely culturally resilient idea within swimming and aquatics is volume equal performance in anything Right, whether it's endurance, whether it's just vo so this is why the world of swimming suggests to young people that getting up at five o'clock and getting in so my my son, right, is a lifeguard, right? He's never been performance swimmer of any kind, but he's a lifeguard, trains a lifeguard. I got up this morning at five AM to take him to the pool so that he could be the lifeguard to watch the lane swimmers. Right. And this is the club stuff. So these are kids who arrive there in their dry robes with their floats and everything else. And I think to themselves, oh, my God, what kind of life is this? And they just do. I'm being I'm generalizing, obviously. But in the main, if you were to go to that session, you would see volume, length, laps and the rationale that the coaches use is you've got to get the miles into your arms and legs. Right. And so McAvoy comes along and goes, well, actually, that's that's actually not really working for me has never really worked for me <laughs> i'm going to try something different and good on him right but like you say how many so most sports are actually out there going right we we need to increase our talent pool we need to do better stuff within that space but what they end up sit doing is is basically like they burn out most most kids just say actually i just can't be doing with this anymore i'm going to do something else and then so they but they they naturally limit their talent pool by of offering this, perpetuating this basically model with very little scientific validity. But I'll, and I'll be honest with you, I've spoken with the people within the governing organization around why do you do this? Like even at the early stages of learn to swim, why do you do this? And there is no good answer coming back. It's amazing, isn't it? It is. Because it's just, again, that's path dependency is, uh, is absolutely purest form. It's what we've always done. This is how we do it. And I, I like, I can completely, like, I was a two-time national um, national breaststroke champion, you know, and I, I was one of those guys that getting up at five o'clock in the morning, going to, before school, you know, going training and, and whatnot. But it was like, I, I've swim 100 meters, you know, but I'm doing like, 80 lengths before going to my science class you know in the morning and you're like and when i look back at it and go what's the point in that and that's what i'm trying to get across is to go who's the gatekeeper here right so players golfers right athletes start to think and go is this serving me and I know that's a big question, but I think if they sat down and I and the reason I'm saying this to you is by when I when I interview them, they start to get it, right? They start to like, but we need to encourage that when I'm not interviewing them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you said that to me before we started recording, that actually your questions are changing them, changing their outlook and their perspective on what they've been doing as an athlete. Yeah, because nobody's asked them those questions before or, no, or they haven't thought about these things. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of, you know, again, the, the help of John and the help of like um, Phil, where they go, is that enough of a question? Like, what's the probe of that? What's the prompt to that? Mm -hmm. Mm. Are you getting enough out of it? And what you're actually finding as I'm as I'm going through it is you start to like set them off and they're away, right? They mm. start to mm. go, oh, mm. hang on a minute. Mm. This is this is not, I haven't thought about this before. What I'm doing might not be right here. Mm. Mm. And that and for me, it's like that's a good thing, right? But why is this not happening? Mm. It, it's interesting for me because, you know, as you know, I'm very interested in ethics. And we talked about ethics earlier on because as a researcher, you know, there's a lot of ethics you have to go through in order yeah. to be able to do this kind of stuff because there are ethical implications. But it strikes me that one of the things that you're uncovering is that these athletes have a serious lack of agency. Uh, you know, there's Massive. A, a, a little, a very little choice architecture for them. They're, they're just essentially passive recipients of information from others who are deemed to be more knowledgeable, who are then saying, my, my, my views and beliefs and opinions suggest you should do this. And then obviously, if you were to probe those beliefs or ideas and say, well, why do you, why do you hold those ideas as being valuable for this individual? Again, you know, I, I you don't always get some of you don't always get the best responses, and in actually many cases, you get very defensive responses when you ask people some of those questions. And the and the sick world of this mm -hmm. of high performance sport mm. is, I've had people and coaches reach out to me and said, "If you keep doing what you're doing, you will never be integrated in teams." Mm. You mean like multidisciplinary teams within? Yeah, like, around players and stuff. Yeah. Mm, wow. Well, because you'll be ostracized by the practitioners within it who don't like the fact that they're having their methods ask questions about their methods. Correct. Jeez. What kind of world is that? So, so you're you, you're essentially taking a role as say you know because obviously in your you've got like a performance director role at Swiss Golf, right? So part of your job actually is to sort of protect some of these athletes and to give them the information to help them make div inferred choices about the kinds of things that they want to do within their training so in a, as a performance director type of role that's a responsibility because your responsibility is to the athlete yeah and to in some respects protect them from you know i'm not necessarily saying these people are willfully unscrupulous actors they're probably actually unaware of the fact that they have limitations in their knowledge that, that does need to be filled in order for them to be able to answer these questions. But their response is to say, you're essentially potentially threatening my livelihood or my status and or my worldview or my sense of identity. And so I'm going to reject you and I'm going to I'm going to make sure I work with a load of other people to ensure that you're ostracized from this community. Hundred percent. Yeah. Jesus. That's that's like that's like that that is sick. That's sick, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, like that is absolutely sick because that to me doesn't put the and it's the same when it comes to like like practice and how people train and whatnot. You know, it's the same. It's exactly the same situation. You know, it's like if you don't confide like this, I call it the mafia hierarchy, right? If you don't confide with how I see the world, then you're not getting into this team. Yeah. You know what, and that's actually um, that sort of thing uh, was. So you may have heard that there was a um, following the athlete A gymnastics scandal. There was a whole Me Too uh, movement in gymnastics where lots yeah. of three hundred, four hundred athletes in in gymnastics, ranging in ages, you know, came forward saying we've experienced similar things, not the same, but similar things, which uncovered a pretty rotten culture within the sport um right from the top you know where you had the the leadership of the sports actually you know actively ignoring 
you know, genuine cases of mistreatment, abuse, et cetera, et cetera, largely because it was a very cozy world. People were married to each other and, you know, it's a pretty toxic thing. So when you read the review that was done by that, you know, expensive review, 311 pages, you know, you go through it and you're like, oh, my God, you know, and you're just like you're closing your eyes because some of the some of the things that come out. But when you look at that, that was pretty much the same. Like mafia, you're talking about this cultural amerta, right, where the athlete has absolutely no voice, right? And actually, Zero. Yeah, and if they don't conform, right, and they don't toe the line and they don't shut up and put up, you know, and they and if they speak out, that's a troublemaker got my eye on you right you're not going to be going anywhere and and that then becomes a self-perpetuating thing where other athletes are like almost using that against other athletes to ensure that the other athletes don't don't progress but it's just a horrible viper's nest of, of of a world and that's why i'm trying to go look at it and go well i'm trying to always trying to encourage the player Mm. to 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 think and make their decisions right and then mm. so for example like when i when i do these interviews right and i go and we have a practice map right mm. so let's mm. say we have all this stuff and i have all this data right from interviewing them and they turn around and they and this is again hypothetical this doesn't happen they go oh yeah i would like my coaching team to know more about x y and z right mm. Mm. That's player. That's the player having this, right? So it's then about not the player adapting to the world that's around them. Then it's about the coach adapting, and that and and I that's how I I see it, yeah. you know, and how I would like it to be. I don't want the coach forcing things onto the player. I want the player to be able to think about this isn't serving me right now. Yeah, and I, and I um, your point about this. So this co-adaptation, I think, is a central feature of, and uh, I obviously would say this because I am, you know, hugely influenced and uh, driven by uh, the ecological approach. Um, but the ecological approach has central to it the notion that um, the we are designing environments. We are environment designers information givers necessarily i'm not saying we don't give information I'm just saying generally speaking we're designing environments where athletes are going to adapt and then we co-adapt with them as they respond to those environments and we and it's done with and it's done through co-design um yeah. you know um and so athlete agency is almost baked into the ecological approach it doesn't work if you don't do it that way <laughs> uh, and so I, I, and I, so I, that's one of the reasons I've actually become such an advocate, right, is because I see so much promise in an ecological approach as, a, as almost like a, a foundational basis through which we see athlete coach learning. Um, and this notion of co-adaptation um, is central, right? So I can't do my sessions well if I don't respond to what the things that the athletes are telling me explicitly or implicitly um i can't re i can't redesign environments for them if i don't tune in or attune to how they're responding yeah um and so you have to have that notion of uh you know information flow being back and forward and i do sometimes feel like that you know when practitioner walls themselves off from the athlete to say <clears throat> like i am the knower and, yeah. and you are the receiver. Yeah. That sort of yeah. power dynamic becomes really problematic. It's horrible. Yeah, and I, and I think that this is what like and when I when I put my um, proposal in to do my doctorate and whatnot, you know, with regards to so the idea is we're going to interview ten ladies and ten um, uh, male professional golfers, and. The idea was around it to start with and go, well, we need to hear their perspective on things, what they believe in, where that beliefs have come from, and how we can help them kind of like move forward. And the idea around that was giving them the power. Mm -hmm. 
not not the coach, right? So so if they turn around and said, "Oh, I feel like my you know my coach in this area doesn't do this extreme very well. He just has me on a mat, you know, hitting pitch shots to like fifty meters, trying to get the launch angle exactly how we want to do it." And you go, okay, well, is that really where golf is and what's going to kind of like serve you to to improve you? No. Okay. Well, the coach needs to get on board with this. The mm. coach needs to be adaptable to get on board with this. Mm. And, then, and you know, the, the potentially this is going to go, this, you know, whoever like listens to this, they'll go, right. They'll turn around and go, don't get, don't let him interview you, right? And again, that might be the case, right? That might be a whole, you know, again, the mafia telling me you cannot do this, but I'll find a way, right? Mm. And we'll find a way of doing it. Yeah. And we'll yeah. find a way of getting through it. And we're trying to find a way of, you know, and again, it's just about the athlete. Is is the athlete getting the right information or the the ben or the most efficient, effective information to apply to their sport? And when we talk about things like when we've spoken about this, where somebody comes in for like, you know, three hours and they go, oh, I'm going to check your technique and then I'm going to do a little bit of skill stuff and then we're going to chuck a game in there at the end. Well, what the, what the fuck is that about? Well, what's the technique about, you know? <laughs> technique about what? <laughs> and, I've been, and I've been in worlds, right? I've been in like in teams where I've gone, okay, well, um, you want to do this? You want to do this and you want to do this. And they went, yes. Okay. And you're doing them in isolated seg segments right now. Yes. Okay. Can we find a way of putting them all together? Yep. We did, right? This player went through it. How did you find that? Oh, I'm so much, so much more real to what I'm like going to experience and, and whatnot. Okay. Coach, how do you find that? Looks so much better. Okay. Brilliant. I get ousted out of the team. What does the coach go back and do? Go straight back to his old one, two, three. He's a... Crazy, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. Um, one thing I was going to ask you about, I just made a note earlier on, just to digress slightly. Um, so uh, you you will know a guy called Scott Fawcett. Yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously for a period of time was a extremely um, uh, vociferous and forceful individual on Twitter, calling lots of people out for basically, you know, talking a load of rubbish. He's obviously developed a uh, sort of strategic, tactical approach to uh playing the game of golf calls it decade um i've um i've explored the uh explored decade and you know kind of tried to work with it and use use quite a bit of it there's a lot in it that's actually quite interesting and there's a lot of kind of sort of good ideas i think in there but the one thing he he i was listening to you know he's got loads and loads of these sort of videos that he's produced as part of the decade uh thing and one of the things he talked about quite a bit uh, and this is where I think he kind of just overstepped and he sort of got out of his lane a little bit was he talked a lot about um, basically just doing block repetition as a mechanism to to basically hit driver. So it's like, you know, you need one stock shot, you know, you need to shake the ball one way. Generally speaking, it needs to be a cut and you just need to hit loads on loads and loads of them. Right. Um, and he then talked about how he was on a podcast. So he used to be on a podcast with um, uh, Mark uh, Crossfield. Um, and Lou Stagner called the Hack It Out got Hack It Out uh, podcast, which I, I really love. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got a new guy called Greg Chalmers on there now, and it's a great, it's a great show. They they do a really good job on it. But it, Scott was on it for a while, and um, he was on a podcast, and he was with and Rob Gray featured on it quite early. Done all he does, early does because Rob Gray is when Rob brought out the first of his books. So he was on the show, and he was talking about like different approaches to practice and like differential learning and all these different ideas. And uh, and Scott chewed him out on this podcast and basically said it was a load of rubbish. 
And I was, I, I've been, for a long time been thinking about this, right, and thinking about reaching out to Scott because I think he's got a lot to offer, but he's just he's, he's transgressed and he's got out of his lane and he's in danger of potentially sort of. Uh, um, I want to say to him, look, you know, you're in real danger of losing your credibility because you're talking about something you don't really know anything about. Uh, I, and and I've, had that same, I've had hand. that same. Conver- I've had that same conversation with him. Ah, okay. Um, I wondered if you had. That's why I wanted to ask you because I thought you might have. Because he. Um... He sent me a video once of him like training, and he was like, "Oh, this is this is my like whatever like block practice session." I said, "But that's not block practice. So, mm. like, where do you go from there? Like, what is it?" And he just yeah. didn't know. Yeah. And and the other thing is, he um, I think he was um, a decent player, right? Mm. Not a very good player, but a decent player. And um, he qualified recently for the U.S. seniors, I think. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And he did a video on on the Thursday of tournament play, and he was like, "Oh wow, this is unbelievable! Like, I spent the last two days like it was blowing. I tried to like hit it low and and whatnot, and now all of a sudden, like tournament day turns around and it." It's um, it's absolutely perfect, and now I need to work it out, like how to hit it high again, and and whatnot. And I'm like going, hang on a minute, why, why are you doing stuff like that at that moment in time? Surely, if you're a competitive golfer, surely you should be have the ability to adapt to whatever comes your way. Yeah. So it's, yeah, so it's it, again, it's, it's it's very much like a. A linear viewpoint of like, well, and he, it's he, interesting. Just, he just he he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, no, so it's honest. interesting. So, so basically, he's got, um, and I think this is where the reason I brought this up was because I think this is where a lot of people are, right? So, um, you're talking about the coach who goes back to the traditional method, right? So, Scott's background as a kind of engineer, stroke economist, yeah. poker player, right, means that one of the things he tries to do is using things like statistics and numbers is essentially reduce variability. So actually, decade is based pretty much on this idea of like y- y- use math to a certain extent and use under- an understanding, for example, of dispersion patterns. You know, stop thinking that you know you will always hit it straight. Know that you have everybody because humans are fallible are likely to have some range of dispersion in their shot and actually play within that dispersion. So choose targets that are within these ideas of dispersion. So essentially, understand human error and make uh, strategic decisions that take those elements into account and therefore reduce the wild ver- or reduce the impact of the wild variability that not having any of these ideas comes in so it's a re- it's, it's sort of a reductionist idea in some senses but but strangely he um when it comes to things like practice if you look at any of his practice activities they've actually got variability built in so if you look at his putting a- activities that he does with people like cameron chan he actually is talking about pace putting but he's creating loads of randomness like yeah. you know at different different distances and recalibrations and all of these sorts of things and and his his athletes have actually taken some of his games and made them better by actually adding in layers of difficulty which is great right and i want to sort of say to him weirdly right you're articulating this idea of like a, a sort of a super metronomic idea around how you're going to hit your driver but yet when you're actually using your practice games you're actually creating variability and i think it's partly because he has two conflicting ideas that he can't quite he can't quite square. One is economics, efficiencies, reduce variability. The other one is explore how you can operate within the dynamics of loads of of, of certain elements of variability. And I just would love to sort of sort of explain that and go, actually, you know what? You're actually on the right lines. And decade could be brilliant if you actually re- if you kind of re- turn around the telescope and look at it in a different way. But it, but it also goes back to you know what Mita Steroni says is that you can you know you can reduce things to its but you're never going to get greatness out of that. So if you with Scott right he yeah. he's looking at it and going I was a good player but I was never a PJ Tour player right. So he's trying mm-hmm. to reduce that to the point of going. Well, I need to. I should be like fitting within this 
this, you know, barrier ultimately, but that never kept, never served him. Right. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I think it's like a, it's like this, it's a flawed like myth. Like if you look at like Paula Silva, like who talks about like anti-fragility, right. Anti-fragility doesn't come from, you know, him doing one thing the same way all the time. That, if anything, in our logic, that makes us go, oh, yeah, that must be, like, anti-fragile. But it makes yeah. us more fragile. Yeah. Well, let, your, your example earlier was perfect. Uh, I, I've i spent ages hitting low ball flight to make it so I can deal with wind. Oh, that's Kane. Now what do I do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the whole Holy game shit. plan's got to go out the window. <laughs> No, 100%. Where it's actually should be about, okay, I'm ready for whatever comes. Yeah. And in this situation today, I need this. And in this situation today, I need this. And in this yeah. situation today, I need this. You, you and reminded that, me. That, you that, reminded me. And that to you... me is like, that to me is anti fragile, right? Frag- fragility to me is going, Oh my God! I'm playing this whole golf course today. I do not have this shot. Yeah. If your practice environment is so stable, and your practice intent is so is based around establishing stability, you will you will always struggle when things are unstable, which they always are. You made me yeah. you reminded me of um, back in the day. You know when I I used to work at uh, at England Golf. Um, when when we sort of first came across each other, um, there was this famous famous situation where England came like 14th in the European Boys Championships, which was like really bad result. Like you know, fourth is a bad result for England, and um, and we 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 came 14th, and Norway won it, right? And so England, you know, famously had something like 2,000 golf courses, 90,000 junior players. And Norway had about, you know, 25 golf courses at the time and about, you know, 400 junior players. And yet they won and we didn't. Right. So we've got all our resources and everything else. And we and like one of the reasons why I was in Czechoslovakia and apparently the weather was awful. Right. And the players all came back saying could not play in my waterproofs. And <laughs> when we did a, when we did an after an after action review on this, we said, well, why didn't you know that? And they went, we'd never worn them before. Why? Because they were training undercover in the perfect, lovely, warm range. Yeah. And when I did a report on this and suggested that's something that we should address, the then secretary, because it was the secretary of the English Golf Union, said, we've been the envy of European golf for the last 30 years. We're not going to be changing things now. (laughs) Okay. Well done. (laughs) Well done. (laughs) Yeah, well done. But this is an idea of culturally resilient belief, you know, and, and, and by the way, this is this is someone who'd, you know, spent a lot of time generating the revenue to build these beautiful practice facilities that were the envy of the country. And, you know, the, the national center. Well, they are. Absolutely yeah, don't amazing. get me wrong. But you but use any the best facilities in the world used wrongly are, are no good to anybody. Likewise, no. the worst facilities in the world used well can be absolutely brilliant, which is like Daniel Coyle's notion of the talent hotbed. Very often, actually pretty pretty poor facilities can be used because of the resourcefulness, really help with talent development. Yeah, yeah. And it, and, it, and I think that's that's part of the whole the big picture, isn't it? Like it's just yeah. it's like thinking about these areas and going, yeah, how am I using what I'm using? You know, rather than just going and again, it, it ties into those those things of like, like one of my big one of my biggest pet peeves in golf is, and it and it tells us how the world is, right? So if if I see somebody a coach turn up on a Tuesday Wednesday of a tournament, right, and they do some work with that player and whatnot, and then let's say Wednesday night or whenever the coach is gone, right. Putting coach, short game coach, there's no coach in sight. It's changing a little bit now. It's getting a little bit better. But what that tells me, Stu, is that the viewpoint is if I plug this in, it's going to fire. 
and it just doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't. Yeah. So it's like it's like looking at that technique of like ball above feet, downhill lie, you know, this this certain si- and it and when you're watching players, and I found this as well. It's a patience world, right? So you you watch and you watch and you watch. Go, oh, this is going great. This is going great, brilliant. I I like that. I like that. I saw this situation. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. And then you see all of a sudden something shows up, and you go, oh, hang on a minute, what was that about? Mm-hmm. And then you see again on on hole sixteen, that same thing like shows up again. You go, oh, hang on a minute, what's going on here? And you kind of like just take a note of it and whatnot and just, you know, a lot of good things happened, but something like showed up there. You just don't see that anywhere else unless you're watching them compete. Yeah, 100%. So in the, in the, and again, this goes back to the player, right? The golfer. If I have, and I'm employing or I'm, I'm percentageizing, if that even, if that's even a word, right? my performance team right i want them to watch me play yeah i want them to watch me under fire and see what's happening and it it might not be every week right but it might be okay this week i'm going to we're going to do prep next week or the, or two weeks down the road we're going to do tournament watching and we're going to see what's happening but it shows that if people are not doing that, their belief system will be, no, no, it's a motor program. It needs to actually, we wired it in enough on Tuesday and Wednesday. It's just going to fire. I'm. Um, it's interesting that I um, this notion of watching play, I mean, yeah. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because like it's one of those sports where very, very often the individual who is deemed to be the coach, as in uh, they very rarely, or in in a lot of cases when it comes to golf, are, are very rarely there with the athletes in the performance environment under the pressure and stresses of competition, uh, of competition, and are then not very able, I don't think, to be able to respond. So this is where the notion of a coach in this sport particularly is actually they're not, they're, they're, they're what I call a technical instructor. So their yeah. role is sort of relegated to someone who understands things about technique so that when the player says this thing has occurred, they, they're the person with the so-called technical fix, which let's face it, in the world of skill acquisition and transfer is rarely anything but a Band-Aid. But that's actually maybe is that is that really sometimes what the player is after? I just need you to give me the band aid to get me through the next day or the next hour or the next however long. At a tournament, I think it is. Yeah, right. but they're not, not there for the tournament. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so it's like for me, it's more along the lines of you definitely need some of that. Hundred percent. Um. But you need, you know, you need, okay, where, like, where the hell are we going with this as well? Like, what, like, what are we, what are we trying to do? Like, what, you know, I saw you hit this particular shot. What's going through your head there? Like, what are you, what, what are you figuring out in in that situation? Hmm. Like, if you're trying to rely on, um, on the player always feeding back to you on that, hmm. Hmm. I mean, it's just like it's just not going to happen, you know. Hmm. Mm. I had a really interesting experience recently where um, <clears throat> I haven't been playing very well all year um, <laughs> and like taking my game really seriously as well as I can, you know, buying decade and all that stuff. And um, I've been playing that well. And um, and then I um, <clears throat> I went out to Spain and played the first day and again, wasn't that good. And the second day we played this really, really tight difficult like you often get you know spanish courses up in the hills on the yeah. outside the mountains right and you know there's there's one particular hole i'll just never forget it where you know it's a par four and i've hit eight iron eight iron because it's that <laughs> yeah, yeah. i know it yeah <laughs> and um 
But weirdly, through the course of that round playing on this course that was super tight, I started to play really well. And it was partly because I was playing on this really super tight course and it really demanded of me particular level of precision and what i found myself doing and i don't know whether it was the course or i don't know whether it was sort of a conscious act but what i found myself doing was becoming much much more um sort of uh, deliberate about my setup a little bit F- feeling a sense of much much more control of the club face i felt like i had to i wouldn't say i was gripping firmer but i felt like i had to create a much more almost like a much more stable and intentional kind of pre-shot yeah, and then sense. and then in my backswing i was much 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 more sort of slow and low right so i felt like i was be, being a bit a bit more kind of deliberate into into my backswing and making it a little more con, not controlled as such but but just felt like it was and I, I then come to realize that none of those things existed before everything was kind of a bit floppy and, yeah. and so <laughs> yeah. surprise surprise the shots were a bit floppy right and I've I've kept that for about six weeks, that same thing. And my handicap's come down two shots since then. All because I got up in the morning on a quite early tea time, having had probably a little bit too much wine the night before, but still got up to play. Played on a really tight golf course that demanded something of me. And then I had an epiphany. I, like, I, yeah. I learned something. And for me, I felt like, like I've been wanting to talk to somebody in golf about this for a while because I felt like that's a really good example, actually, of how an environment created an adaptation that's then helped me in terms of then going to play on other courses but i think it comes that back down to like in golf like first principles is like you know club face and path right mm-hmm. like we get mm-hmm. so bent out of shape about what's your right elbow doing what and if we and if we look at like end directed learning mm-hmm. right and i'm reaching for something mm-hmm. nobody gives a fuck about what your elbow's doing or your bicep is doing You know, it's like, okay, how close... And if you look at watch a kid do it, they'll miss it on the left, they'll miss it on the right, they'll miss it... And that's how it works, Stu. Mm. Like, it's it's Mm. really just the, like, okay, I need to have a level of control, but nobody talks about this, right? Nobody Mm. talks Mm. enough about club face there, path there, how good can we do that, right? Mm. They're always Mm. talking about, and we see this on social media, and we Mm. see this on, like, uh, just people like breaking the swing down into like mm. these mm. segments. That's not, it's not fundamentally good to do that. Yeah. Right. It might look good for social media and followers and, and stuff like that. But if we look back even to the sixties, right. And we look at golf, if somebody's going down the viewpoint of going, do you know what? I'm much more down this um, information process inside of things. And I'm much more, you know, motor program based. If we look at a discrete skill, a discrete skill has a clear starting point and has a clear ending point and it happens really quick. Yeah. A golf swing, a putt, a chip. Okay, brilliant. Back into the 60s and then into 80s, Richard Schmidt and his his predecessors realized If you break that and you segment that, it's going to have a very, very low transfer rate. Yeah. But what do we freaking see on social media? People who are influential others, right? Breaking freaking the golf swing movement down into you need to do this. You need to stop halfway down and do this. It's absolute bullshit. (laughs) You know what? You've also reminded me of something. I went down the YouTube rabbit hole. So <laughs> serves me right. Serves me right, right? <laughs> and I've stopped doing that. Uh, and I've also got a net and a launch monitor in the garden. And then, do you know what that made me do? Start chasing speed. And of course, like, that's, the, that's the, you know, I'm 50 years old. What am I trying to do? But, the, <laughs> you know, but the thing is, is that, you know, I, I did I did some of that chasing the speed, right? But the launch monitor helps me a little bit because I can't practice all the time. So at least I get an outcome and I've got some data. And yeah, I yeah. Can, How, I, 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 use... I think that's brilliant. I think an yeah. outcome is brilliant. Yeah. Like, what's your face doing? Where's your strike point? What's yeah. the path doing? It gives I think you that's feedback. Brilliant. Yeah. That's, that's kind of all we're kind of needing, right? Yeah. And, and then we kind of self-organize around that to go, okay, well, how can I get face more 
there and start it over there a little bit more. And that's what yeah. I loved about, again, going back to one of your pre, like Chris Kilmurray talking about, you know, reductionism, right? Mm. Of this. Mm. There's no place for that, Stu. Like in, in any form of like a, a viewpoint of how you look at the world of like learning. Like what? Like why are we breaking stuff down into into these fragments? I just well, don't so, understand it. Again, right? So reductionism exists everywhere, right? And 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 it's it's pervasive, right? It's like pe people don't even realize how influenced by the notions of indu of um of reductionism they are. They they don't realize it, and they also don't realize how the information processing narrative of human advancement or human motor control or whatever it is is pervasive and exists you know to the point where like i get frustrated because you know the if you're if you are an ecological practitioner or an ecological advocate and you advocate for it you get a criticism by those who are um more cognitively inclined or information processing based that you need to prove your assertion like theirs are just uncritically uh accepted like they're just, but but science advances, right? So different ideas come into play. We 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 explore those ideas, and we we then make advancements. We might say actually there's limitations to the ecological approach, which means we have to go down a different direction. But but we have to explore those with with real you know kind of vigor. Otherwise, we yeah. never really properly explore them. And I think as a practitioner as well, you know, I be I've become you know kind of theoretically informed, let's say. Uh, you know, kind of evidence informed. And so I'm thinking, right, well, I, I need to really give this a good go. Um, yeah. If I, if, I, if, I keep, if I keep hold of some old ideas, then I won't really be properly advancing my practice. I'll just be like, I, I, maybe I will, but it'd be very slow. Um, and I might not have some of the epiphanies that I would otherwise have if I took a more sort of, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm not saying I'm like just, wholeheartedly going right i'm really into this now so all you lot you got to come you got to come with me whether you like it or not i'm not going to do that right <laughs> but but maybe it's about also let's say i go and have um a putting lesson right mm. and i and i pitch up and mm. somebody goes right we're going to come into my studio and we're going to check your technique to start with mm. and we're going to look at your face aim and stuff like that. There's no context to this. It's just on a straight putt. And we look and we wire you up and we do all this. All right. Now we're going to go and set you a skill of like, maybe we're going to add some reading into that. And, you know, you know, but it's still a 10 to 15 foot putt, right? It's still in the studio. All right. Now we're going to go outside and we're going to put you into a nine hole putting task, right? A game. And we're going to see how you do on that. I'm like, all right, great. What the hell is all that? Is that is that just easy for the coach? Mm, mm, mm. I think it is mm. personally. Yeah. Also, it's what's expected from the people, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a mm. really good point. Mm. Rather than going right, we're going straight into the fire over here. We're going mm. straight out onto the golf course or straight out onto the putting green. We are going deep into this right now, and I'm going to watch what you're doing under these levels of, you know, you're going to put 100 bucks on the line, and we're going to see how you do in this situation. Somebody turns up and goes, holy shit, I wasn't expecting this. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, and then they feel, oh, it's a bit weird. I'm not sure about that one. I'm not, and they're, the, <laughs> yeah. they're, the, they're the people paying. goes back to your point about the police study. You know, these people intuitively think, you know, they go, mm, I'm not sure about that. I didn't really like it. I much prefer the safety and comfort of the linear approach until you go, but <laughs> yeah. look at your result. Oh, Christ. All right. I get it. But you're not, you might not, <laughs> you, in, in a sectional scenario where someone's paying for a service, you might not get that opportunity again. It's no, interesting, no. by the way, that, that someone like Kendall McQuaid, for example, who I, who I would argue is massively ecologically informed, whether he espouses the theory or not, he's been a practitioner you know, in, influenced by um, Shoemaker on this idea of more a more naturalistic approach to 
learning, right? So that's his basis, right? Which is where I think the ecological approach stems from. And he used to, when I watched him do this, by the way, watching him work, he'd spend a good half hour talking to people, you know, almost doing a micro lecture on skill acquisition to contextualize the approach he was now going to utilize and to get their assent. It's interesting yeah, that he had to do that. So, jo so John, like my supervisor, he says, you need to farm out a little bit of um, education as well, because you need to, mm -hmm. you know, and he's worked in, you know, two Rugby World Cups, Olympics and whatnot. You need to get a little bit of education in there to be able to kind of guide and like shape and, and see where they're at ultimately. But you also get the that principle of, yeah, like I remember like speaking to, um, I did a, a presentation in Germany and Andreas Kali, right, who's in Denmark, he he, came, he he pulled me across after and he said, um, just out of interest, why do people not go play first and then see what happens and then we work back from that? And I said, well, Joan Vickers talks a little bit about that, to be honest, like hard first and then we work, we work backwards. He goes, mm -hmm. why do we not do that in golf? I said, because it's comfortable doing it the other way. Yeah, 100%. I remember talking to a coach after uh, uh, Hank Haney's uh, second at, uh, on um, at the European Teaching and Coaching Conference in Munich. What a what a weekend that was! Anyway, uh, I remember watching talking about you know the model that because Haney had this kid and he was basically like a human sling machine. He kept moving this fifteen year old into position, and the fifteen year old couldn't keep holding the position because he hadn't. I, I remember that. Yeah, I remember, remember seeing it. it. Yeah. 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 We might have talked about it over a beer. I've forgotten about it. But anyway, um, I was talking to a coach about it. I said, oh, it wasn't Haney brilliant. wasn't Haney brilliant. Oh, so technically, such a technical insight. Da, 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 da. I'm like, yeah, but you not notice how the kid couldn't actually do what he was asking him to do without him being moved into position? Oh, yeah, but you really knew what he was talking about. I was like, oh, hang on a second. This is before I knew anything about ecological approach, by the way, or skill acquisition. It just felt intuitively wrong to me. And then, and then I was talking about that very notion of play first. Like I said, you know, why don't we... Why don't we do that with kids like that? Like work out, like, you know, start them on the putting green, get them some success to begin with, and then work backwards, chipping and then pitching and then extending it backwards. And, you know, so they learn the game, you know, which again reminds me, by the way, of um, meeting Rudy Durant, Tiger Woods' coach, yeah. when Tiger Woods was little. I might have told this story before, you might have heard it before, but, you know, I deliberately went up to him and said, How much time did you spend on the course with Tiger? Because they had 18 old par three. How much, this is when kid, uh, Tiger was like five. How much time do you spend on the course? How much time on the range? And 85% of the time was on the course. And the only time we went on the range is when we found something out on the course that we needed to go on the range to work through. But so you know the like funny a, thing a about unique it, upbringing, is where, isn't it? But the, the beauty of that, when you see the video, right, and, and I've spoken to Rudy about this, is that you watch him and, you know, when you talk about these things called, you know, intrinsic dynamics, right, mm -hmm. of like somebody has stable states in space, Right with what and it's a it's like you're looking at Scotty Scheffler with regard to top of the backswing, Victor Hovland, whatnot. He's trying to change that, right? <laughs> you're you're literally like yeah, you're banging your head against the wall and you're gonna ruin them, right? Mm -hmm. But they all have this ability to with their coordinative structures, so their coordination mm. will be able to get that club coming down somewhere. Right with a low variability into delivery to what they need to do with their, with their outcome. Yeah. But people get so caught up in this principle of like what it needs to do up there, what they need to do there, what they need to do this. And this is my biggest critique of like the, you know, the, the P system, because it's just, yeah. Unless it's like deliberate or, or individualized to that individual, to that person, mm. it's completely ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Um, yeah, I mean, we 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 could go on. <laughs> um, um, the, the interesting thing for me, though, just going back to this point about because I don't want this to be a, um, well, it has been. So it, uh, you know, but I want to make something clear here, which is not to say I, I, I'm not coming on this podcast with you necessarily criticizing the coaches, right? No, because in my opinion, I think they're victims of. It, uh, inadequate educational systems and some dominant cultural narratives that are very hard to break and cultural expectation amongst those who would help them to make a living um, and it's very difficult to break that sort of stuff right I, and I understand all of that right so I'm not blaming them you know it, I'm not blaming the 
um, the individuals themselves. I, I'm, this is actually a call to action for uh, those involved in the learning of athlete or the learning of coach to rethink the paradigms that they just sort of accept as sort of norm. And, and that's the beauty of it is like, like why we called it practice thinkers to start with. It was like, it was very much about like, we're not trying to tell everybody you need to do it this way. We're just trying to get them to like think, you know, mm. and go, is this serving me right now? Or is this something different? Can I do something different to help my players and, and whatnot? And when we did the course, you know, and the, the coaches course, and we're actually doing a player's course as mm. well, which is again, my passion to be quite mm. honest, because I want players to look and to think and go, do I need to, is, is this, does this feel right to me right now? Mm. Is this like yeah. how I, can I get more out of what I'm doing? You know? And it's like anything, like if somebody would have, when I worked for Ledbetter, somebody would have critiqued me, I'd have got so pissed off, right? Because yeah. everything was about that model, right? Of how, I, how everybody needed to swing. You need to hinge at 90 degrees pivot transition and deliver right and that's fine right but the thing about it is i never took offense by somebody going yeah that's that that can't work i tried to move on from it and try to understand and i think that's the biggest thing Stu, is that we're anytime we are you know we're talking to coaches and we're talking to players anytime that they feel awkward and I do this when I do presentations as well, is when I, when I say something and go, how are you feeling about this? Mm. Anytime they feel awkward, it's probably challenging their belief system. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then we can start to, so it's not a case of going, okay, I feel awkward. If I'm going to hit back on this, that's my ego. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Can I look at it pragmatically go, holy shit, this makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable, but I want to explore this a little bit more? Yeah. 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 You reminded me of when Rick Shuttleworth pushed back on me when I was expounding all my highfalutin notions of massively reductionist uh, talent development system and coach education, coach development system working in rugby. And he challenged me really hard on it. Or push back, not hard, just you know, in a, in, a, in the softest way that Rick Tuttleworth does, but just made it really clear that you know <laughs> does I didn't he, really does know what I was talking soft? about. Does he? <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. You know, in, a, in a, but it's also it's like it's like being I don't know how to. Say, I guess it's like being like punched in the face by a giant marshmallow. Like it really still hurts. <laughs> You sort of think, well, you come away, right? You're really bruised, but you don't know how you were bruised. Right? <laughs> uh, and he, uh, yeah, yeah, but he did, right? And I was like, and I, I went away and did like, you know, proper, you know, got got all, you know, like bent out of shape and went, mm -hmm. and then then I then went through a process of, you know, like massive reappraisal and like, well, Christ, I clearly don't know anything about anything. And then now I'm, you know, and then you start learning stuff and you go, wow, now I'm on a different path. So I'm enormously. Is that not? Is that not? I I love that state though. For me, mm, like mm. when some when somebody like flattens me with something, and I go, "Oh my god!" And I, you know, like Ed, like Colin, sometimes just like completely flattens me with something, or you know, Ian Renshaw or whatnot. And you go, "All right, I need to go and like take a deep, uh, a bit of a deeper dive into this and got, start to like understand this like a little bit more." But there are certain people in the world that look at it so much of a threat about their who they are what they're expected of them whatnot like we asked a, we, there was a coach who um wanted to do our course right and we said okay yeah no problem just can you promote it and he goes oh yeah i forgot about it but can i still do it i'm like no you can't do it <laughs> you know there's this somewhat somewhat levels of entitlement that goes along as well that people don't want to look at themselves in the mirror and it's a horrible face to look at sometimes like i look at myself i go fuck it out like what but but that's how we grow and that's how we consciously and ethically move forward 
Yeah. And that's how golf potentially needs to be. Golf needs to be more rigorous. Teaching yeah. aids need to be more rigorous. Yeah, People shouldn't be able to bring out a teaching aid just for the sake of showing a fucking world number 10 using something and sell millions of dollars worth of yeah. a teacher. That's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. It's wrong. The, you know, the, uncrit the uncritic uncritical acceptance of stuff needs to change. It's in just, sport. it's just flat out wrong. And I think yeah. that got it like in some instances of golf, like in the, like what Sasha was doing, I think is brilliant. Right. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. bringing much more like rigor and science into certain things. And I know the guys at Ping are yeah. doing that as well. But, but in the world of skill acquisition, we need to, golf needs to get on board with this. It needs to do a better job of going, mm. is that good? Mm. Or is that, or is there better? Mm. You know, why you're using a, a teaching aid that lodges into your shoulder and then you have to pivot. Yeah, but mm. what the, what's that for? You know? Mm. Mm, mm. Is that going to help you transfer, or is it just going to make you lodge something into your shoulder and make you pivot? <laughs> oh dear. Um, listen, look, we could go on. I'm just about to get locked out of this building, so uh, I'm going to have to dive off. Um, Th thank you so much for your time, as always. Oh no, 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 no. I'm glad you could, glad we could. I, I know I had to shift this around a bit, so I appreciate your patience with me. Um, but uh, I, I loved it. Great conversation. Uh, keep keep doing what you're doing with with Pete and Ian, loving it. Um, it, you know, I love that. That is a, you know, you give me those moments of reappraisal. With the conversations you guys are having, I'm like, oh no, yeah, there's there's something else I haven't thought about. That, I kind of a bit like you. I like being in that slightly unstable state of of not knowing. Um, you know, I have I have enough enough certainty about sort of the course of action, but I know there's still so much more to learn and more to know. Um, yeah. Uh, and so I really appreciate. I think, it. I think uh, more. I think more podcasts going down the road need to be like this one. Hopefully, players listen to you know, mm. and we need to look at it as athletes listening to podcasts rather than you know yeah. coaches, because ultimately sometimes we're feeding the bias to coaches. Right, with every podcast, we need to be able to get into players or athletes and go and challenge what they're thinking about. You know, and that's. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm going to be sending out. I'm just going to, this is one for the players, not just ne ne not necessarily coaches, and, and for young young people as well, parents who essentially are part of the, you know, the ecosystem. Are, yeah, 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 exactly. They're an extension of the, and, and one of the podcasts had a really good idea that somebody threw at me, Tom Hartley, which was this idea of the parents being the multidisciplinary team around the athlete. When when you're talking about a kid in a community context, you don't have psychs and physios. You just got a parent. <laughs> who's responsible for putting the tea on the table, right? They're the multidisciplinary team. <laughs> do you know what I would love to do, Stu, right? If we yeah. can get if we can get it across, then I'd have to um get a player to be okay with this, but to do a live session of going through the practice map, right? Of what we do, like what I'm trying to do with from an academic standpoint and actually like the 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 applying of practice and see how that kind of works. It takes about like an hour, hour and a half. If the player's willing to do that, I'm, I'm certain other players will learn from this. Well, I'd happily, I'd happily come and film that. I've got the kit. Um, let's make it happen. There's, uh, there's, there's several reasons I'll happily come out to where you're based in Austria, particularly <laughs> as you move into the winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? We have a, we have a ski slope like 30 minutes from us, which is, a privately owned ski slope and it's like we can drive there and whatnot and we go up there you don't have to pay the extortionate like lift fees and and stuff like that and that's why it's nice you know mm -hmm. there you go do you, uh really Stu, thanks very much on. all right um where, where's the best place for people to get in touch with you if they want to ask questions Pro or get clarity probably on instagram like Stuart m coaching is probably mm -hmm. the best it's the same on um, on X, or I still call it Twitter some days. But um, yeah, you can, you can fire away. Or if they want to just send me an email, it's also good at Stuart at icebergolf.com. Cool. Mate, it's been great to speak to you again. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks for, very much. Uh, ranting along with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perfect.